everybody. Uh, good afternoon and, and welcome. Um, my name is Tony Lemieux. I am a founding co-director of the Atlanta Global Studies Center. And I wanna welcome you and thank you for your uh, attendance here today at our symposium. Um, and this session in particular, Agree or Disagree, Reducing Polarization and Engaging Students in Civil Discourse. Uh, this uh, session is co-sponsored by the Department of Political Science and Philosophy at Georgia State University and our Center for Human Rights and Democracy. Um, I'm really excited to, to have this, uh, this session today and this, this uh, you know, great sort of and critically important and timely topic. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we are, have stri you know, strived to do in the Atlanta Global Study Center, part of our mission is to build that sort of international awareness, global competence, um, you know, language capacity, but really thinking about pressing global problems and challenges. Um, polarization is really high among those. Uh, and so I think, you know, how we engage our students, how we, you know, figure out how to teach uh, and, and really model uh, this sort of uh, work is critically important. And so we're honored uh, today to be joined by um, our, our presenter. So we have Dr. Jennifer McCoy uh, and Dr. Andrew J. Cohen. Um, so let me do a quick introduction uh, and then we'll get right into the, the heart of the matter. It, it, Jennifer uh, McCoy is not able to join us today, but has provided a video um, for some of her uh, presentation, uh, you know, in, in the content. And then what we'll do is um, hear from uh, Andrew, who's here live, and then we'll have some time for uh, discussion. So uh, Dr. Jennifer McCoy is a political science professor at Georgia State. Um, at, in 2009-19, she was a uh, senior core fellow at the Advanced Institute of Advanced Studies at Central European University. Um, and has been a Georgia State University Distinguished Professor. Uh, previously, she was in the inaugural class and was my colleague and the director of the Global Studies Institute uh, in 2015 and 16. So we got to work together closely. Um, prior to this, uh, Dr. McCoy was the director of the Carter Center's Americas program from 1998 to 2015. And she worked on democratic strengthening, mediation and dialogue and cooperation. Um, her work, uh, she's a specialist in dem democratization, polarization, mediation and conflict uh, prevention in Latin American politics. She's authored um, or edited six books and dozens of articles. So a very productive uh, scholar. And her latest work is Polarizing Polities, a Global Threat to Democracy, which she's worked with, uh, with colleague Marat Sommer. Uh, and that was published in 2019. Um, so we welcome her to this uh, the session, and with us here live today is Dr. Andrew J. Cohen. He's a professor of philosophy and founding coordinator of the program in philosophy, politics, and economics. He's the author of Toleration and Freedom from Harm, Liberalism Reconceived, which was published in 2018, and Toleration, uh, which was published in 2014. Uh, he's widely published in journals like Ethics, Canadian Journal of Philosophy, um, in the International Encyclopedia of Ethics, uh, the Cambridge Companion to Liberalism. Um, he's been looking at toleration or its lack in our system of criminal law and business ethics, and he's currently writing Honest Public Ethics, Toleration, Applied Ethics, and Civil Discourse, uh, which provides a toleration-based approach to applied ethics and the ethics of public policy intended to help improve discourse. So, Again, if ever there was a critical and timely uh, range of topics, here we are. So uh, welcome today, uh, Dr. Cohen. We're delighted that you're here to be with us. Um, and, and so before we turn it over, I just want to uh, give a couple of, of housekeeping items. Um, the session's recorded, so please do keep your, your, your mics muted. After the presentation and discussion, we'll have some time for audience Q&A. You can type questions in the chat along the way. Um, or raise your hand uh, when we get into that, um, that portion of the program. The other thing, if you need to or would choose to or like to have the closed captioning function, that's enabled in the session. So you can uh, select that at the menu at the bottom of your screen if you're meeting. And with that, let me uh, turn it over to Andrew. Thanks. Um, so I'm not gonna say a whole lot to start with. Um, we're gonna turn it on Dr. McCoy's uh, video momentarily. Um, I'll just 
by way of introduction, I'll say that uh, Dr. McCoy and I have been working together uh, with students to do some Braver Angel events on campus. Um, we're both obviously very interested in the increased polarization and threats to democracy due to that. Um, our takes are somewhat different, um, or at least our starting points. I'm, I'm not a social scientist, so I'll, I'll talk more about what I do later. Um, but uh, Dr. McCoy and I have been working together on these things for a while now, and I've come to really appreciate her, her standpoints on these things and find them really helpful. And I think you will as well. So we could go ahead and start that video. I'm Jennifer McCoy. I'm a professor of political science at Georgia State University. And I'm glad to uh, join this panel today. I am doing research on uh, us versus them, sort of toxic political polarization and its negative consequences for democracy around the world. And from that research, uh, I came to believe that it's extremely important that we equip our students with skills to not only understand uh, what's behind this kind of polarization, but also how to respond themselves as citizens, as individuals. And so I devised some um, strategies some, and some methods and activities uh, for my course, which is on political polarization and democratic erosion. And I'd like to share some of those uh, with you today. So I will share a brief PowerPoint and discuss it. So our panel on civic education in response to democratic crisis. Um, as I said, I'm starting out with some of the lessons I've learned from uh, my research. And that is that this kind of us versus them polarization that we have harms democracy in several ways. First, it reduces contact and communication between people with diverse points of view. We tend to isolate ourselves, to socialize in our own bubbles. And this happens socially and politically as well. It inhibits cooperation and compromise in, in problem solving. We see that with uh, government dysfunction, with paralysis, with Congress not being able to make decisions. It creates, among individuals, it creates dislike, distrust, and demonization of the other side, of the out group. And so we build these stereotypes, these biases, and we generalize about the other group, the other political camp. And that leads to actually perceptions that the other camp, the other side, can pose an existential threat to the nation or to our way of life. And if we view that anybody is an existential threat or any particular political party or leaders, then that will motivate us to endorse or support um, leaders who will violate democratic norms because we believe it's more important for our side to gain or retain power than it is to look for perhaps compromise negotiation for the greater good. So what are some classroom strategies to help students um, develop coping skills or responses to polarization in their own lives, in their own careers, whatever their major or their discipline? Um, there's three I wanna share with you right now that I've used in a course that I've been teaching the last couple of years, which is specifically about this topic, polarization and democratic erosion but I believe that these strategies can be used in any course that you are teaching. Uh, the first is uh, creating ground rules at the beginning of a course, a class for civil discussions, particularly in this contentious time, this contentious political environment. And especially if you're going to be talking about contentious politics or any kind of issue that is divisive, which now can be almost anything uh, from environmental science to uh, economics and the role of taxes to almost anything. Um, the second are open mind modules, which is a platform, uh, online platform, where students can learn about the science and the psychology behind polarization. And they can also learn conversation skills on how to communicate across differences. And the third is an activity that you can do in class 
to engage in deliberative dialogue, which is another form uh, to bring new information, new awareness to people and to help them consider alternative uh, solutions to various kinds of problems. So for the first, uh, in terms of setting ground rules, what I've tried uh, recently with, since we've been on Zoom is I do a Zoom poll at the beginning of the, uh, of the semester. And I tell them I wanna ask them to answer questions about what makes them hesitant to participate in a classroom discussion. And then we look at the results and then I ask them for their ideas on what should be our classroom ground rules to have respectful um, civil discussions that will encourage people to participate and, and air their differences, not to you know, try to just uh, hide any differences. So I give them questions like this in the poll. Unfortunately, on Zoom, you can't do um, open-ended questions. If you have another format where you can do open-ended questions, you could just ask them. But I gave them things like this. I feel unprepared and uninformed. That is, I feel dumb compared with other students. A lot of them answer that one. I, um, I feel hesitant to participate when I feel disrespected or criticized by other students or when I feel vulnerable exposing something about my identity or experience, or when I see others who are distracted, who are just not paying attention, kind of rude in that way. And then we go on and discuss what are their ideas for ground rules. And that seems to work pretty well. The second thing um, that I wanted to show you is this open mind platform at this website.org. And it's a virtual learning experience. And uh, what it does is it, it, it's helping them create these competencies that I was talking about, communicating across differences, but also to understand the brain science and the psychology underlying um, the, the, what happens when we're in uh, us versus them kind of differences or in-group, out-group conflicts and how just normal um, human behavior and the psychology of it can impede us from crossing divide. So if we are increasingly in divided groups, then our normal human psychology and the workings of our brain can pose these big obstacles. So the more that students are aware of these obstacles, then uh, it's easier for them to, to deal with them in a positive and constructive way. So this website, which my students love, and I just give them, it has eight online lessons, about 30 minutes each one. It has built-in quizzes as they go through. It has practice activities in each one. And it, they're really kind of fun, you know, um, uh, modules. And it provides you an instructor dashboard so you can measure student progress throughout the program. Um, they have an optional additional thing where they give you instructions for how to create peer to peer conversations that is pairing up your students uh, to after every two lessons so they can practice the skills they've learned. And it is all based on science. It's all evidence based uh, program. So my students have really enjoyed it and they come. I've had them since we've been online. They do it, you know, as Kind of homework preparation for the class. I ask them what they've learned and they can really come with, wow, you know, this is really helpful. I learned this and that. Um, and I have spread it out over the course of the semester, uh, but then tried to relate it to some of the things we've been talking about. So I want to uh, just show you a bit of the website. So I'm going to uh, change my share screen to show you a bit. So here um, you can see, and I hope we can see this. I think I better put it up here so that you can see hopefully the screen better. Um, the website, so these are the eight lessons. And if we look at each lesson, it gives you a little description. So like the first one, explore the inner workings of the mind. Uh, and it says, we'll start by getting to know the two systems in our mind, automatic and controlled thinking. We'll learn a helpful metaphor, the rider and the elephant. 
to understand how these systems work and what we can do to think more rationally, even in the heat of a disagreement. And so then it's going to go on um, from there. And I can show you a little bit of the demo. So you can see, you know, they're using a little bit of uh, graphics, cartoons to uh, show the, the, the learning kinds of things. So two, two types of thinking. Uh, where you've got the automatic and control, that is basically the gut in instinct and the rational part of the brain. And it goes on to uh, teach the student um, about that and then asking them um, questions. And, at, and, and then every once in a while, it'll ask them um, a question here to review. And so it will give them a choice and then it will tell them if they're, if they're right or wrong. So let's see if I answer this one. It'll say, you know, very nicely, not quite, uh, and go on and explain what they what they missed there. So going back to my presentation, um, these the topics covered in here. are these eight. And so you can see the first one is about the science, the brain science. The roots of our differences, um, they actually use moral foundations research by Jonathan Haidt uh, coming out of social psychology. Cultivating intellectual humility, that's great for students to learn at any, you know, at any point in their uh, student career. Welcoming diverse perspectives, exploring other worldviews, challenge the culture of contempt, so being a oh, careful about how you respond to somebody who really disagrees with you, managing emotions during difficult conversations, and then mastering difficult conversations. So actually really tips on how to carry out a difficult conversation. So I would really recommend um, this website. I think it's, it's really very good. The other thing they do is they give everybody, all the students fill out a questionnaire to start with, and then a questionnaire at the end. So this is a pre and post course questionnaire for open mind to measure the, um, the impact, what people are learning from their course. And by the way, they offer this also for corporations, for um, you know, any kind of organization um, can use this, can access this, this website. Now, the um, third thing I wanted to show you is an activity about deliberative dialogue. So this is a new effort. This is designed by political scientists as a new kind of mechanism to try to overcome our uh, political problems in, in problem solving and kind of the separation between elected officials and citizens and problems with uninformed citizens as well. But how could citizens be better informed, help to form decisions on complex policy problems and have input um, with their elected representatives. So it can be done at the citizen level. It can also be done with elected representatives or just among elect like state legislators. Uh, but this is the idea behind it. What is deliberative dialogue? Scott London from the Kettering Foundation says, it's a form of discussion aimed at finding the best course of action. Deliberative questions take the form, what should we do? The purpose is not so much to solve a problem as to explore the most promising avenues for action. Deliberative dialogue differs from other forms of public discourse, such as debate, negotiation, brainstorming, consensus building, because the objective is not so much to talk together as to think together, not so much to reach a conclusion as to discover where a conclusion might lie. So considering alternatives, receiving information about the alternatives and discussing together, which can often help to change your own mind. Um, there is a group, Project Pericles, which is trying to help uh, instructors use this activity in a class to try it out. And you can do it in any discipline. So they have, um, uh, deliberative dialogue discussions. They have little modules for you with resources, with little introduction on different topics. 
that you could use in any any discipline uh, you, and you can come up with your own. So I came up with my own that I want to show you that was relevant to my class. And it was on this topic. It just happened uh, in Georgia. It happened uh, that I had scheduled this session for them to try out deliberative dialogue at right after Georgia, the Georgia legislature had passed the election bill, SB 202, that has gotten so much uh, attention and controversy and discussion. So I just uh, wrote this little intro for, for them about it. This is the problem and then the questions that they were going to address. So it's ensuring equal access to voting. In today's polarized environment in the United States, even the act of voting is interpreted through partisan lenses. Georgia has been ground zero for the debate about voting integrity and voting access. The new election law passed by the state legislature in March 2021 has been interpreted by Republicans as expanding access and by Democrats as restricting access. It has also engendered responses calling for boycotts, statements of concern from corporations, and condemnations of those statements themselves. And the decision by the Major Baseball League to withdraw the all-star baseball game from Atlanta in protest. So then the questions for the students to address are, in what ways does the new law expand access and in what ways does it restrict access? And for whom? Given your own assessment of the impact of the law, what should be the response by civic organizations and citizens who have concerns about it and want to bring about further change? And then uh, what you do is you give them some possible responses, issue stances. It's recommended not to make it just a binary, either this or that, but to consider at least three possibilities so that they can be creative and think about alternatives. I gave them five based on what I've seen are the actual responses people have taken. So the first stance they might take is citizens and organizations should embrace the new law because it expands access to voting and protects against fraud and isn't as bad as it could have been anyway. There were more extreme ideas that the legislature did not take up. The second one, organizations and industries should boycott Georgia until the legislature changes the law and citizens should boycott corporations to press them to speak out before such laws passed in the first place in Georgia and other states. So that could be a, a, a second stance. A third one would be responding to corporations who, who criticize the law and say instead, sorry about that, I just, Lost this somehow. Okay. And instead, uh, boycott the corporations who criticize the new law because they should not interfere in politics. A fourth stance might be encourage companies to stay in Georgia and support voter mobilization efforts rather than donate to legislators who support restrictive voting laws. And a fifth might be focus on national efforts to create uniform voting standards since the states can't be trusted to ensure equal access to voting. So these are all positions that have been taken by someone or some organization um, in Georgia. And what I did was then I asked the students to, um, I, I, I gave them articles and pro and con articles and kind of fact checking articles so they could learn about the law. I gave them articles about the responses that people had taken and I asked them to consider, we've been studying resistance uh, to, um, to political change um, around the world and different methods, uh, including boycotts and strikes and stuff. So I asked them to think about those as they were considering their responses. And so they had, they, they had to come prepared and then they had about half an hour with their group to uh, in small groups, I break them out into breakout rooms. So they had about four people in each group where they kind of discuss this. What have they learned? What are the pros and cons of the law? Um, okay, now what should be the response? What should be the civic response to this law? And I gave them a poll beforehand asking them which of these they favored before they started the discussion. And then I gave them a poll after. 
And there was some change um, uh, before and after. So it was very interesting to see. So this was a way for them to actually practice uh, a new method that's been proposed as a way to kind of overcome uh, some of our polarization um, in the country as a new, uh, a new strategy. So those are three ideas that I wanted to share with you. And I hope you will have um, a great discussion, including with your own ideas that you have tried. Thank you very much. All right. Hopefully everybody sees the PowerPoint now. So I'll just start out by saying I agree and do a lot of the same things that Dr. McCoy does. There are some differences, though, uh, obviously. Um, part of that is probably because of where we come from with these things. We come at it from different angles, from different places. So I thought I'd just mention a little bit about myself and where I come from first. Um, so I'm a philosopher, like I said, not a political scientist. Um, so, and my earliest work was really about the relationship between individuals and communities. I then moved in and did a lot of work on toleration. And as I continued working on toleration, I kept getting asked to comment about free speech issues. Uh, a lot of what I do is arguing that we should tolerate a lot more than we do. And so I think that people naturally thought uh, I should have something to say about speech, more speech being allowed and questions about whether or not hate speech should be criminal and things like this. So I started moving into writing about the ethics of free speech. And that brought me to talking more and more about discourse. Um, again, part of this is the perspective issue. As a philosopher, I am naturally inclined to uh, debate, right? Philosophers and lawyers love to argue about things. Um, I think there is a difference. Lawyers usually want to argue to win. Uh, at least good philosophers want to argue to get to the truth. Um, and I think that much is the same, much the same is true of anybody that's doing anything in PPE. Um, if you're in political science and you want to try to figure out the best way to have society, you're going to be interested in this. If you're an econ and the same questions, you're going to be interested in this as well. So for somebody like me, getting into disagreements with people where we're debating things to try to find the truth is for sort of first nature. By contrast, I think our society does not value disagreement much at all. Our society, I think, really disvalues disagree disagreement. I think children, young children are often shushed. Their, their questions are not appreciated, especially when there's mixed company around. As children get older, um, they're often taught before they go to a, a relative's house or a friend of the parent's house, you know, don't ask any questions about politics or religion. And so it's not really surprising in a society like this that disvalues disagreement that we grow up not really valuing disagreement. And so it's not surprising that our students come to us often surprised when we think that disagreement is acceptable. At the same time, it's, it's always a, a, an impressive thing for me. It's something that always makes me happy to see that there are a lot of students that come to us really, really looking for that, really desiring it. And so I think what we want here is something like this, and a, a little preface to this. Um, in my classes, since we've been online, I've been having them do weekly one sentence assignments. I ask a question each week and they have until the end of the week to answer it, usually about the following week's readings. In this week's case, as we're ending the semester, the question was simply, what's the most interesting or important thing that you learned this semester? And this is what one of my students in my philosophy of law class said, which really made me quite happy because I wasn't really talking much about polarization in the class, but the student responded, the most important thing I took away from this class was how important it is to depolarize my thoughts and be open to hearing everyone's thought processes and reasonings for why they believe something should be an aim of law. Right? I didn't actually, I wasn't really aiming to get them to see the importance of these things for depolarization. It probably did come up a couple of times throughout the semester, but that really wasn't the goal of the class. So when I got that response to the, the weekly assignment, I was quite happy. Um, and I think the question then is, well, how do we get it? How do we get more of it? 
right? And for me, I, I'm constantly thinking about how to get more of it because I want my students to be involved in the class as much as possible. I prefer to have a discussion with my students rather than lecturing. If I'm, if I'm lecturing in a classroom for more than 15 minutes, I'm thinking something's going wrong, right? So I try to encourage it. And the way that I go about encouraging it um, really has to do with the ground rules um, and it's setting those ground rules right at the beginning. I don't do what Dr. McCoy does in terms of talking to the students about what makes them not uh, participate and what sorts of rules they think we should follow. Rather, I tell them, I tell them this on the syllabus, which usually, or at least they can see before the class even starts. I tell them this in the first meeting and I tell them to tell it to them repeatedly, especially early in the semester. Sometimes I have to repeat it again later in the semester, but usually not. Usually they sort of get the point uh, within the first three or four weeks. So this is one, I have two quotes from my syllabi. It's pretty much on every syllabus I use, uh, really trying to make clear to them what I expect. So I say respecting someone does not require respecting his or her views. While everyone has a right to her or his opinion, that opinion may be wrong. While we should assume everyone here is intelligent and worthy of our respect, we should not be surprised to find that sometimes they hold views we cannot respect. We can still respect the person. There are good reasons why people, including very smart people, sometimes hold false views. Parentheses, there are people, some far, far smarter than me, that think I hold false, even crazy views. So I try to get them to understand that disagreement is okay, it's to be expected, and they should recognize that even I have disagreements with people, and I recognize people who I think of as smarter than me who disagree with me, and that's okay, and they should recognize that that's okay as well. So the second quote that I want to give you is this one, I highly value honest and unimpaired but respectful and hopefully friendly dialogue. You should not pretend to think I am or anyone else you respect is right when you don't. I will extend you the same courtesy. To do otherwise, I think, is to fail to show respect. If you don't indicate your disagreement, it would seem that you think your interlocutor is not worth correcting. That is, you don't respect her. As I come to this class, assuming you are worthy of respect, I will indicate when something you say is questionable, leaves you committed to something I reject, or even that you're simply wrong but feel free to challenge me. I expect you to do the same and I may challenge you. I expect this sort of respectful behavior of all in the class. It's my hope that this will allow for a maximally tolerant, open and honest discussion. Right, so right off the bat, I tell them, I expect them to question me and they should expect to be questioned. I sometimes give them examples of theories that have been widely accepted and then questioned and found to be false. Um, throughout the class, again, I'm a philosopher, so this isn't surprising. I often engage in the Socratic method. I'm asking them to really question everything. And I make clear to them that questioning everything is what I expect. Um, so I, we, we might read a particular article, perhaps by somebody in philosophy of law for that class or in my PPE class, it might be an economist, it might be a philosopher, it might be a political scientist. And I want them to question it. And there are times when we'll read things and I'll question it. Uh, and I'll point out, this is a really strong argument, but here's a problem with it. What do you think? How, do, how could the author possibly respond to this criticism? And sometimes they will come up with ways that they think the author could respond. There are occasions, of course, where students don't see any problems with the text. They think, wow, that's just super smart, uh, the argument's clear, we have to accept it. Uh, and sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong. I will sometimes, this is more common in lower level classes for me, uh, I might present, a, a, present an author's view as more extreme than the author intends it, just to encourage the students to question it. And again, I find that quite successful. The students get to recognize that no matter how smart the person is that we're reading, no matter how smart the person is that they're in dialogue with, there's going to be room for questions. So we're reading something, I want them to question it. Uh, I might say something and I'll want them to question it. I don't want them to just accept my word for things. And similarly, they'll say things and I'll question it. That might be particularly difficult in some cases, uh, 
again, our students often are shocked when somebody disagrees with them. Um, but I think it's important for them to realize that disagreeing with them is not disrespectful. It's a matter of saying, why would you believe that? I've always believed the opposite thing. Talk to me about this. Show me why you believe this. I want to know more about it. Right? And doing that respectfully can really pull out and get people to engage in a discussion that can open them up and get them to see that they really haven't thought something through, perhaps, or that they have and that they need to do more of it, right? So for everything that we discuss, it's going to be open to having debate about it. And I, again, make that clear throughout. So I, I might intentionally start with some texts that are really easy to do that with. Um, again, that will be depending on the class. The point to all of this, from my, to my mind, is to really try to encourage them to engage in dispassionate reasoning, right? To get them to understand that they don't have to answer every question just to satisfy some preconceived notion they have. It's not all about motivated reasoning. It shouldn't all be motivated reasoning. It should be that they are capable of stepping back and considering their views dispassionately, trying to figure out whether or not they hold a view that they can actually argue for, that they can actually defend and uphold, right? And if you put it that way to them, they start thinking about, well, can I actually justify my beliefs or not? Right? And once they start doing that, I think you start reducing the polarization because there's you start finding that people are a little bit more cautious about what they say and recognize a little bit more that uh, they haven't really thought things through as clearly as they thought they did. And they might have just accepted certain beliefs because they thought everybody accepted those beliefs. And so getting them to sort of step back and say, well, these are my beliefs, but they're questionable too, really going to be very important. My standard approach for doing that, for getting them to think dispassionately, again, I teach philosophy. So this is, this is usually in a moral philosophy class or a political philosophy class to some extent in the philosophy of law class. I'm trying to get them to think about what justifies any particular action or what justifies any particular interference, whether it be from the state, the legal interference or what have you, right? And so I put that in terms of principles of toleration, which I've written a lot about. And so obviously I like to talk about it. Um, and so there are standard principles of toleration that have been developed over the last however many centuries. Um, some people put them in other terms, but these are basically principles that say, if you accept this principle, these sorts of activities are going to be justifiable, those sorts aren't, right? These sorts of activities are going to be such that we must tolerate them, that interference there is not acceptable. These sorts of activities are going to be such that we have to say, whoa, there's reason to interfere here, right? So a principle of toleration, a normative principle of toleration, basically indicates when toleration can end and interference can start. And so I'll often go through the, through the principles with them. Sometimes I do this by looking at a famous author, John Stuart Mill, it offered us the first uh, clear version of the harm principle. Um, and then there's obviously issues with other principles as well. So reading on liberty with them is really, I think, a, a great way to discuss these things. So I'll discuss the harm principle, legal moralism, legal paternalism, the offense principle, the benefit to others principle. Some of these are more commonly discussed than others. These have been used in discussions of legislation. They've been used in judicial decisions. So they're out there and they can help us figure out again, dispassionately without trying to figure out in advance what we want from the, from the situation to figure out what is acceptable. So you might have a case say, uh, so might, the debate might be something really significant in our society, like abortion, right? Well, if you accept the harm principle, does the harm principle allow us to interfere with abortion? If you accept legal moralism, does that allow you to interfere with abortion? If you accept paternalism, does that allow you to interfere with abortion, et cetera? Uh, it can really be used for any sort of applied issue, any sort of applied political question, Immigration is another great one, I think. Um, if you endorse the harm principle, should you be uh, interfering with, uh, would it allow you to have legal interference with immigration or do you have to tolerate immigration? If you accept legal moralism, does that allow you to interfere with, with immigration or does it require that you tolerate immigration? 
So getting them to recognize that there are principles that have actually been accepted, right? Accepted in philosophical texts, accepted in judicial decisions, accepted at least by some what, peop, what some legislators say they're doing, whether or not it is what they're doing, uh, can get them to see that there's a way of discussing their own views that's, again, stepping back from their own biases, their own prejudices to think about these things more dispassionately. I will typically do that also with a discussion of various values, right? And so the values that I put up here, personhood, rationality, eudaimonia, fairness, consent, freedom, autonomy, integrity, some of these are very common in philosophical ethical texts. Some of them are not. Uh, eudaimonia is common to a certain group. Autonomy is probably, except, is, uh, autonomy and freedom are probably common throughout. Integrity is surprisingly not discussed by moral philosophers, but I think is very important. And so discussing these these values, especially along with the principles, allows us to talk about what it is that the students are actually trying to defend and why. And again, pushes them to step back from their own beliefs and say, well, what justifies my belief or what could I use to justify my belief? And that allows them to get into a discussion with somebody who has very different beliefs. And if each of them are doing the same thing, we come to the table ready to have arguments about these things. And often, if you, you know, if you come into my class in the middle of a class period, you'll, you'll come in and you'll see exactly that, right? You'll see students arguing with one another about a particular view, right? And that's what we really wanna see. And again, I'm, I'm constantly impressed with how many students really wanna do this. And there are times when I felt like there isn't enough. So I've, I've had classes where the class period is over and the students don't wanna leave. They still wanna keep discussing these things. And about four years ago, maybe three years ago, um, it was about three years ago, I think, right when the PPE program was starting up, the undergraduate PPE program was starting up, I encouraged a group of students to start uh, a, a, an organization, a student organization, that would allow more opportunities for this sort of debate, this sort of face-to-face, -face, uh, let's figure out what we think about this issue sort of debate not a debate to win, that's not the point. The point is to have a discussion where we can learn each other's views and recognize that there are alternatives to the way we think about things, recognize that there are justified beliefs that go against our own. So that they started the civil discourse forum. Originally, I had pushed them to uh, the students that I was working with to join and become a chapter of Bridge USA, which is a national organization that does these sort of things, national student organization, which I have a great deal of respect for. They do, I think, really, really interesting work, really good work. Um, but the students at the time weren't interested in that. They didn't want to be affiliated with some national organization. They wanted to do it on their own. Uh, and you know that's fine, that was their choice. Um, and so they, they formed their own group and they, they came up with the name Civil Discourse Forum. <laughs> What the Civil Discourse Forum does or did, um, what it's going to do in the future is not entirely clear. Before the pandemic, uh, they ran monthly meetings, right? It was like, I think it was the second Wednesday of every month or the second Tuesday of every month. I won't remember exactly what the thing was. And the core group of students, and the core was, depending on the semester, anywhere between four and eight students, they would get together and come up with a topic for discussion. It could be something that you'd be sure to get a lot of conflict about. Um, they did gun control, they've done voting rights, they've done all sorts of things like this. They've, they would come up with a topic and they would start the topic by discussing, um, they would start the topic and this, they would start the meetings by presenting uh, certain basic facts about the topic. So the meetings would be in the evening. I had a grant at the time and so I was bringing pizza with me for everybody that attended. This was a way of bringing more students in, uh, but interestingly, the students that came only for pizza usually ended up staying for a good long time and enjoying the conversation. So the, the core group would then start the meeting by presenting some basic facts. They might talk for two or three or four minutes, but then they would step aside and just let the conversation go. We did this in a room uh, in the student center to have four or five tables with anywhere between four and eight students. And one of the core members would be at each table, sometimes more than, depending on how many students there were, it might be more than one of the core students at each table. And they would sort of be there monitoring the discussion, making sure it continues and making sure it was civil. 
And in the few years that we did this, I think there was only one occasion where, I'll put it this way, at least one student left and would never come back, <laughs> right? And that, that's unfortunate, but to have it be one time out of two or three years of doing this, I was quite happy with this, right? I thought this was, this was great. Um, and this was all done by the students. I would attend the meetings out of curiosity and to make sure the pizza was delivered and stuff like that, but I would rarely talk. Right. I didn't want this to be, you know, here's a presentation by some exalted speaker, you listen and then you'll have a discussion afterwards. I wanted this to be, and the students wanted this to be, a chance for them to discuss the issue on their own. And it worked really well. And then the pandemic struck, <laughs> right? And with the pandemic, the, the switch to online for the Civil Discourse Forum didn't go all that well. Um, the Civil Discourse Forum tried one meeting online, the attendance was low, the way it went was not that great. So we sort of backed up a little bit. Um, but then I had been talking to somebody at Braver Angels, Georgia, and I've been a member of the Georgia chapter of Braver, Braver Angels for a couple of years, and they wanted to do stuff with us. And I was thinking, I thought that was a great idea. And so I brought it to the Civil Discourse Forum and saw what they thought, and they were all eager to do it as well. And so Braver Angels, provided us some support to do this in terms of doing it on Zoom and all of that. We did a red blue workshop with them. We did a depolarizing work, a depo depolarizing within workshop, all of this online. And the numbers weren't huge, but they were impressive. And everybody involved was happy. Everybody involved, everybody that I talked to about it was quite happy with the way these things went, right? They were happy to learn from other people, they were happy to think the red blue workshop, those are the hardest to do because apparently red people don't like to come out for these things. Um, but, and, and you need an e e even balance to make it work. The depolarizing within workshop, we had even more people than that and it worked really well. People learned how to sort of step back and have a discussion without it polarizing. Again, I think that was great. And then, um, through another organization, I learned about what ACTA was doing. ACTA is the um, American Council of Trustees and, uh, and Alumni. Uh, if you're interested, it's at, uh, I saw that the Georgia, the Braver Angels thing was is up. So uh, ACTA is at goacta.org, G-O-A-C-T-A.org. Um, and they have partnered with Braver Angels to do uh, Braver Angel debates at college at colleges throughout the country, right? And so what they were doing, this is before the pandemic, they were doing these debates throughout the country at college campuses very successfully, right? And then the pandemic hit uh, and they were able to pivot in a really interesting and powerful way. They pivoted everything online and they started doing more debates, of course, because this is there's less cost involved because you're online. They started doing more debates at more colleges more often. Uh, the last time I talked to our contact there, he was like going through three debates in the following week, right? And they partnered with us to do a debate here. We did a debate, this was just three weeks ago, I think. We did this debate three weeks ago and we did a, the debate, the topic was, uh, is deplatforming on college campus acceptable? And the debate was great. We had 70 odd people sign up, 40 odd people showed up. And of the 40 people, I think 37 or 38 stayed the entire time. And it was like an hour and 45 minutes, a little, we went over a little bit and 37 or 38 people stayed till the end. All of them were thrilled with it. All of them really liked it. And again, it, it was a very civil discussion with very serious disagreements. I, mean, I, I Last semester, I taught a couple of classes on about free speech on campus. So the students were primed for it. I had a bunch of students that were ready for it. Um, I'm sometimes amazed at the, the students that take the wrong side of the issue. I won't tell you what that is. Um, but the discussion was really wonderful. And I think the students got a lot out of it. And doing more of that, I think, is a, is a great way to go. And I, I plan to do more of them in the fall. And with that, I will stop sharing my screen. And I am open to discussion. Uh, 
Um, Michael Hoffman. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. I have a question for Jennifer McCoy. And uh, this is about the following. I, I mean, I, I, I was impressed by both talks. So thank you very much for that. And this is really inspiring to see how, with, how, how you can cope with the problem of polarization. I'm wondering about the following, you know, I mean, given what Andrew told us about people's uh, reluctance to engage in disagreement, what I experience in my class is I'm not, I'm not uh, engaging with polarization that much as with wicked problems. So problems, especially with, the, I'm a Georgia Tech philosopher at Georgia Tech, <laughs> sorry. So, and, and uh, these are mainly ethics classes where we talk about emerging technologies as wicked problems. That means that you have a multitude of uh, uh, a stakeholder perspectives. Now, what I'm wondering is the following, you know, I mean, in uh, Geneva, you approach diversity and kind of the, 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 the thinking in, in polarized categories is very important. What I saw in contrast is that people, uh, students, they, they often seem to have really a strong interest to get everything done as smoothly as possible. So they don't engage in any kind of disagreement, and it's all about finding consensus and getting a good grade. You know, so I'm wondering how you, whether you see something similar, and how how you would cope with that problem. Thank you. Thanks. So, so Jennifer's not here, so she can't answer. <laughs> oh, so that was only a video. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I, you're right. That is clearly an issue. Uh, I see the same thing with our students at Georgia State. They want to know what's the, what's the easiest way to get through the course. What's the easiest way to get through the the requirements? What's the easiest way to get their degree? Um, my only answer is maybe not what I would like to be the fact, <laughs> but I think the fact is you have to figure out a way to make them interested in it, mm -hmm. right? I think for for me, that's partly the topics and partly the readings. Um, but I also think, I'll be honest, I think there are students you're not going to reach that they, they're here to get a degree and that's what they want and you're not going to stop them. Uh, I think those students tend not to be philosophy majors and I'm guessing they tend not to be poli-sci majors. I could be wrong about that. Maybe one of the political scientists in the room could, could speak to it. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know that I have a better answer than that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear one if you had one too, by the way. Other questions? Any suggestions for improving the way that students relate to one another and relate to us? Maybe I add something since nobody else is, is talking. Um, uh, the, what I think, what I found really uh, very helpful in the classes that I'm teaching is um, focusing on what I what's called stakeholder analysis. So, um, you know, when, when you have a, a problem of a certain degree of complexity, then the ethical challenge often is to see all the stakeholders and how they might be affected by a certain decision. And what, what turns out to be a very useful approach is to engage the students in a stakeholder analysis in which they are required, first of all, giving a certain problem formulation to identify the stakeholders. So who are the people who are affected by a certain decision? And then to trying to formulate the position of the stakeholders and providing a justification for their position. And when you do that, you know, then you engage them really in trying to put themselves into the shoe of other people, you know, and, and trying to understand the legitimacy of a position they would not share simply by asking them to think about the justification of this position. So that that uh, I found was also a very useful approach. Yeah, I like that. I've done something similar in lower level philosophy classes uh, where uh, it's clear that a lot of the students are there because it satisfies a requirement that they need to get out, right? The core has to be satisfied, et cetera. Uh, what I'll do, and I think this really comes down to what you're suggesting, I'll say, some of you are really just want to get a degree and that's fine in our society a degree is a really useful thing um can you tell me why you think a degree is a useful thing right talk to me about why you think that it's 
that's what matters and not actually learning, right? Tell me why you would rather get a degree than actually learn all this stuff. Or is that the case? Or am I, I misunderstanding it, right? Sometimes it does feel like they're there to get a degree and they don't really care about learning anything. Uh, and so, okay, tell me if that's re really your concern, tell me why you're here. And alternatively, if that's not really your concern, tell me why you're here. Mm. So that, that's as close to what you've, I haven't, I didn't put the terms into stakeholder analysis, but yeah, that's what it comes down to. Mm. Yeah. You know, I'm mainly teaching engineering students. So we are offering ethics classes across campus at Georgia Tech. And, and, the, and there you see that probably much more than in a philosophy class, you know, in a philosophy class. I mean, who studies philosophy? These are people who are really interested in the, in the stuff and, and the career uh, kind of uh, possibilities are not always in the foreground of their decision making. Right. Yeah, well, fortunately, at least some of the, the, some of the core requirements are satisfied with philosophy. So at least you get them that way, but yeah. yeah. Hey, Andrew. John Schwenkler here. I don't have my video on. I'm your uh, Braver Angels colleague. And uh, ex excellent presentation really uh, enlightened me. And I have a question of curiosity for you. Not really germane, but I am curious. Given the structure you described, how, how do you grade your students? How do you give them grades? Uh, well, it depends. <laughs> Right, so this semester, almost everything is online. So these weekly one sentence assignments are 10 points and they'll get a zero to 10 on that. And I try to give them some advice about this. And the point really, part of the point there is to get them to write well. Um, and then the larger, the next larger assignments are what I call four sentence papers. This, this was not my idea, but uh, it's, it's a great idea. It really forces students to come up with a paper topic that they can do in four sentences and write it really, really clearly. And that's graded on a 40 point scale. And again, they have a scale on the, on the syllabus that tells them what this is. And then they work up to a two page paper, which has, uh, I think that one has an 100 point scale, if I recall correctly. And again, that's put on. Um, but what they're graded on really more than anything else is their ability to justify what they're claiming, right? There, there's it, the, the grade isn't based on whether you have this particular view or that particular view. The grade is, can you actually argue for it? Right? That's all that I want from them is to be able to argue for it. And, and this semester and last semester with being online, it's all been on these short written assignments. So that involves them learning to write well as well. But Andrew, you never actually grade their discourse, You know what they're in their interactions, correct? Um, yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I do give them, I, I tell them they can have their grades bumped up, up to two thirds of a grade if they participate in class. So there's incentive okay. to participate in class, but it's, it's, there's no, I used to penalize them if they didn't participate in class. I used to actually grade class participation. That was just a requirement. And somewhere along the way, I became persuaded that wasn't fair because certain students will not participate for reasons having to do with personality or whatever it might be and it really put them at a disadvantage. I'm, I'm not sure I should have changed, but I did change. So now it's, this can help you. It can get you up from a, a, a C, a C plus or even a B minus or whatever it might be. So yeah, they're, they're that actually- Makes sense. Thank you. Good. Thank you. No problem. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions. If, if nobody else has a question, Andrew, I had one, you know, sort of thing I was thinking about sort of in this context, you know, especially around some of the issues and topics on which we really do see increased sort of polarization in, in terms of some of the, 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 the subject matter. And I, I, I wrestle with this because I think one of the things that, that has come up here certainly is how people are able to kind of you know, put themselves in other people's shoes or perspectives or see the world in particular, you know, ways. Are there any topics or issues where you find like a real sort of problematic from an ethical perspective of like asking somebody to assume, you know, a, a, another perspective, like in my sort of work in like the kind of, you know, violent extremism space, for instance, we sometimes have to do that, but it gets a little bit 
sort of tricky when you're you're talking about some of those issues. It's like, well, how far do you push and where do you go? Are there some sort of issues or positions that are, you know, you just don't want to validate that you don't it's like the sort of you know the critiques of like the devil's advocacy and in terms of arguments and like well why would you force somebody to take this awful abhorrent you know position on an issue that so i i guess you know my question is are there some areas where this kind of approach might not quite work as well or might be problematic in its own way if there are i haven't found them yet (laughs) Right. So, I mean, I will say there are times when I don't want to ask students directly what their view about something is. Uh, and sometimes that's because I'm afraid that some of them have the view and I don't want to know it. And some of them, sometimes it's because I think some of them have the view and won't say it. Uh, either way is problematic. So sometimes what I'll do is I'll put it in, in terms of other people. Like how many of you think that there are people out there that believe whatever the case is, right? How many of you think that uh, those you grew up with believe that? blah, blah, blah. How many of you think that 20% of Americans believe something like this? And that allows us to discuss it again. It's just a matter of pushing, pushing to discuss it dispassionately, right? It takes them out of it. It's like, what do you think they actually view it? And then once you have it on the table, you can discuss the merits of the case much more easily, I think. And, and in that regard, I think this goes back to, you know, my training is in social psychology. So when you, you know, when I hear, you know, talk about social psychology, my antenna go up. But, but one of the things that comes up in that context, uh, apropos of your example here is, you know, the kind of consequences of, of misperceptions of a social norm in terms of then people, like if people say, well, you know, some of the classic studies in this were, for instance, around like teenage alcohol use and abuse. And, you know, the perception is that way more people are doing this thing than, than actually are. And so one of the things that that approach might get at would allow you to correct some of that base rate information to the extent there's data there, if, if that were part of the discussion. But I guess what you're saying is it just it gives sort of shield to a position to say, I'm not saying this, but people, people are saying, it. people would say. That's right. And I'll get students then who'll say things like, well, I wouldn't defend this view, but da, 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 right, and they'll put out whatever crazy view it is, um, and that's useful, I think. And I think I, I, my view is on a college campus, really nothing should be uh, forbidden to be discussed. So I'm pretty open to these things. I think my students come to learn that I'm pretty open to these things. Yeah, and I think that you set that that stage to sort of like lean into that discomfort as, as well. Yeah. Yep. I think they need to know that it can be incredibly valuable to, to face that discomfort. Absolutely. Um, so I'm Michael Elliott. I teach a city and regional planning program at Georgia Tech. Um, so I'm curious about public settings. I mean, you're talking about a controlled setting in which people are, um, you know, kind of being guided by a syllabus and by you. Yeah. Um, and so there's all this kind of issue about who gets invited to universities right. for conversations. And um, so just given your background, I'm wondering what role do you see those kinds of, of um, you know, speakers who are, I don't know, lightning rods, but the catalyst for particular perspectives yeah. um, and the debate that happens in universities around just their, their presence on the university? Yeah, so I'll say this. We ran um, a public talk by two speakers who, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the organization now. They, they're also affiliated with Braver Angels, but they run these, these speaker series where they have, these, they have pairs of speakers who vehemently disagree about something, right? But who are on the same, the same wavelength in terms of we have to discuss it. Right, and so we ran one of these uh, about racism. This was early on, this was probably three, four years ago, maybe. Um, And we had a pair of speakers, um, a a black man who had been in prison and then got out of prison and has been very successful in various ways since. And a white man who came from a fairly privileged background um, and was a minister and they're like the best of friends. Um, but they were open to having a, a debate in public. And so this was much less of a controlled environment. 
it's still on a college campus, I admit that, right? And there are certain limits to that, but we really tried to open it up as much as possible and invite community members in. I'll be honest, I don't think the speakers did the best sort of job they could have done. Um, neither of them were academics. Um, and I think some people in the audience expected them to respond like academics, being able to answer sorts of questions about the social science and things like this, that they just weren't, they weren't really prepared to do. But the discussion, I think, still went really well. And at the end of the discussion, there were, I mean, I think there were probably, I don't remember, like 120 or so, 130 people there. And at the end of the discussion, there was a really, I thought, interesting discussion uh, that I was involved with, and at least one of the speakers was involved with, and a bunch of the students were involved with. And it was all about, you know, what is the nature of racism? And is that the same thing as, uh, 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 what's the term, white, uh, not white privilege, but- Supremacy. Yes, white supremacy, thank you. Um, right, is, is white supremacy a variant of racism or is it the same thing? Is, is, and is white supremacy the same sort of problem in terms of, is it as prevalent as other forms of racism? I thought it was a great discussion. Um, and again, much more public forum, much less controlled. And so I think that can work fairly well. And they do those, or they were doing those quite a lot. And I think Brave Angels, their own in-person uh, events were, have also been great. I've participated in several of those. Those are not on college campuses. Um, they could be really anywhere that they can get the use of a, of a hall or what have you. Um, I participated in a red blue workshop where um, I had to, there, I, as always at these things, there are, there are fewer reds and I'm neither red nor blue. So I volunteered to be read for this occasion. Um, and I ended up getting paired with this woman who, uh, who was a Trump supporter because she thought having Trump in, audit in, in office was necessary in order to completely demolish Republicans and make sure Democrats control everything, right? And so I'm sitting there thinking, I don't think you're a red. <laughs> like, that's not what we mean, <laughs> right? And, and again, this is a, a, a public forum, right? I think the discussion that came out of that was really quite useful. So I, I think these things happen, not only in these controlled environments. Uh, when Brave Rangels does these debates, they do try to keep very formal. Um, I wish John was still here, he could talk about it a little bit too, but uh, the representative from ACTA served as the moderator for the Brave Rangels debate that we did here. And he does a really good job of keeping it dispassionate, right? And part of that is, you're not speaking to the previous speaker, you're speaking to me, but you can say things like, I would like to hear the previous speaker say something about whatever it is, right? Um, and, and that really helps, I think, keep the dispassionate uh, flavor going. Part of it is probably self-selection also, right? I, I take it people that are gonna get uh, really upset and, and violent aren't gonna show up to these things. Um, I, I will say sometimes you worry about who's going to zoom bomb, but we we haven't had that problem either. So I hope that helps some. But I think you're right that the more public these are, the the more problematic they are. I should say one more thing, which is uh, I'm the advisor to to two student groups, uh, uh, and the other one I, I won't go into it. But uh, I sometimes wonder if they were if they had funds to invite people who they would invite. Um, and my basic view here is. If, if you're involved with student groups, you have to talk to the students in advance and make sure you know that they don't have desires that they'd act on to invite, I'll say non-helpful speakers, <laughs> right? Uh, like there's no point in inviting somebody like Milo Yiannopoulos to college campuses. He doesn't, he, he's not an academic. He doesn't have anything particularly valuable to present. Uh, and so I just said, no, you, that's not somebody that we'd invite, right? We have to figure this out in advance. Um, so I have pretty clear views about the way the controls for those things should work as well. Again, a college campus, but I think we can uh, have controls over that at least. And, and some of the problems that have happened on college campuses have not been because of invited speakers. But I, I don't think we should be inviting people that are gonna cause problems. Unless there's some, you know, maybe there's some exception, but I'd have to hear more about it to know. Great, thank you. 
Andrew, one of the questions that, that we'd like to, you know, kind of bring back into focus here is how you see this sort of uh, approach really fitting into developing and establishing the kind of global, you know, competency, cultural competency, the ability to sort of have those conversations and communicate effectively and embrace that diversity of perspectives. So different, you know, backgrounds, different levels of, 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 of power, or perceived power, actual power, um, other kinds of social and cultural dynamics that really sort of play out on a global space. How do you, how do you see this sort of approach working there? Well, we up in here. Okay. Uh, um, the, the answer is complicated, right? I think that in fact, uh, there's only so much that a college can do about these things. Um, I think a lot of this comes down to, I would just call it a culture of parenting, right? And if parents are going to shush their children when they ask troublesome questions, if parents are gonna tell their kids that they shouldn't ask about politics when they go to Aunt Sally's house, you're going to have to expect that these problems are going to come up, right? Um, and I think the only thing we can do is encourage students to think about that so that when they become parents, they don't do the same thing. Uh, I think we've seen increased acceptance of diversity uh, that's been really helpful. Um, I know that you know you can try to expose your own children to different things in ways that can be helpful. Um, but I, I don't claim to have a full answer to any of this. And I think these are really, really tough questions. But I think, so one of the things that Dr. McCoy and I are working on uh, is looking for a grant to allow us to actually check the success of the Braver Angels style workshops. Um, and so, the, so Braver Angels has some evidence for uh, uh, the success of the workshops in terms of how it changes the attitudes of participants I recall correctly, up to like two weeks out, right? And it, it, the evidence suggests uh, immediately after, it's very clear there is a change in the attitude and, and the people that participate are really much more accepting of difference, much more of a, accepting of, of talking to people they disagree with, much less likely to see those they disagree with as evil. Um, and I believe, I believe it's two weeks out that the evidence still stands, that they, there's still a significant change in that regard. Getting longer term evidence, um, would be really, really helpful. And um, we're talking with a colleague at UGA who does, uh, she's a communication professor. Uh, and one of the things that she has in her lab is the ability to test, uh, what's the right thing? Um, uh, she could do a spit test to test some chemical that is more present. And I, I wish I would remember the chemical name, but I don't more present when there's uh, anxiety, <laughs> right? And so when, when people are anxious, they, they produce more of this. And so you can test how, how much of it there is. And one of the things we're working on together, Dr. McCoy, myself, and, and the CGA professor, and, and a couple of other people, uh, we would do the same sort of test that Braver Angel has done, which is basically self-reporting tests, but also combine it with these tests of the, of the chemical compound in their spit to see whether or not the anxiety levels have decreased, which would you know, give us good evidence for the success or failure of the Braver Angel style uh, approach. And if we can, this is, gets more significant, we'd like to go out you know, six months a year, but whether or not we're gonna be able to pull that off, I don't know. So I'd like to see more of that tested. Uh, and you know, if it turns out that the Braver Angels approach works, I think we should push for more of that. And I have my own question about Braver Angels, essentially. Uh, one, one simple question is that you're teaching people to communicate with each other and recognize their differences, but that comes at the cost of encouraging them to really sort of push to get to the truth, right? You're, you're, you're encouraging them actually to recognize a point where it's okay just to disagree. And I see that as useful. But as a philosopher, I'd also like to encourage people to work to get to the truth, and that's going to be absent. Uh, but you know, if if we could get evidence that the Brave Angel style thing worked, and people were changed even six months or a year out, I'd be like, absolutely, we need to go for that. Yeah, it's a great point. And one of the things that you know, just thinking about, and I know you know Jennifer uh, McCoy has been active in this space, but I'm thinking about 
you know, some of the places where, where this might scale or, or at least have a, an application, you know, some of the, the opportunities for like international virtual exchange, for instance, where you have students sort of working across, you know, cultures and, and from different countries coming in and talking about uh, particular topics. And that might be a, a place where you can also, you know, think about that sort of the global dimension. The other question I would have is sort of how much, like what's the sort of dose response effect in terms of the number of, of the kinds of interactions? Because I'd imagine people who are discomfort, you know, have discomfort, you know, either you might lean into that or might self-select out of it. And so, you know, even if there is a dose response effect where you start to get better and more comfortable, some of the people who you know, feel that sort of discomfort as you might be able to detect in some of those, you know, physiological or arousal measures. And there's a number of ways to do that kind of work, but having that uh, yeah, kind of, uh, you know, uh, be something that, that that's in the mix where you'd be able to control for that a little bit more would be really interesting. Uh, Michael, do you have a question? I saw you yeah. back on the screen. I just- uh, Yes. Um, uh, Andrew, I, I really find that interesting that you're, thinking about assessing these processes. I'm, I'm wondering uh, whether you have more criteria on your mind uh, of what should exactly be measured. I mean, you are, you are only mentioning change of attitudes, but it may be that change of attitudes is not really the most important thing. For example, it could be equally important that people learn to make a distinction between respecting the person, yes. but disagreeing with the position. I mean, that was something you mentioned earlier. And, and, and things like that might be, so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, would it be possible to develop an assessment tool that is kind of more fine grained so that, that we really can learn some more detail about that? That's great. Um, being a philosopher, not a social scientist, um, I'll have to talk to Jennifer about it and see what she can. <laughs> I like that. Just want to write a note down about that. Can we test? That's, yeah, I think that's a really great idea. I mean, one thing, there's already a lot of literature uh, coming out from James uh, Fishkin about uh, deliberative polling. Uh, and he, so he always, I mean, during all this time, he uh, evaluated what he was doing. And uh, what he measured and what seems to be significant is the amount of information. So, that, you know, the simple fact that people learn a lot by means of deliberation. And it, 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 there, there was one interesting observation that he made was, so he, he said, you know, um, if you compare the learning in Denmark and in the United States, it turns out that the Danish don't learn, learn anything. <laughs> and the reason is they're already much better educated, you know? <laughs> so, you know, so, it, but that is something that's kind of important, especially for the polar, polarization debate, you know, I mean, people often have the tendency to reduce complexity to one thing, you know, which is kind of a, a, a signifier of, of ignorance, you know, you, you don't see the complexity of the issue. Um, so uh, kind of, um, if, if you think about these kind of assessments, it would also be important to assess where, the pe where people are coming from. So what's their baseline, you know, not only with regard to their attitudes, but also with regard to pure knowledge and factor questions. Right, I think that's exactly right. It's, it's clearly true that people uh, learn by thinking through things. Uh, just, and I think I try to stress that with my students as well. You're gonna understand this material more and better if you actually come to class ready to discuss it and ready to debate it, right? And debate with one another about what the author is saying or whatever the question might be. Um, and I think the most successful students do that pushing that to the broader society. <laughs> that's, you know, that goes back to Tony's question. I think that's really hard. Um, I think we need changes. I don't know how to do them. <laughs> well, th th this has been, I think, great. I wanna, you know, just sort of note the time. We have time for probably one more question if, if, if it's, uh, if anyone has one. Well, I think, Andrew, thank you again so much. This has been a really good, 
really good session. Um, and I'll, I'll uh, send thanks as well to Jennifer. Um, we've got a lot to think about here. I think one of the, the, the sort of questions of, you know, how we bring, you know, the kind of perspectives and, and skills. And I know, I think uh, there's probably some good interest now in better angels in this, you know, more about the model. And, you know, uh, so that might be an area where uh, people would want to follow up. I want to thank everybody for joining today. Um, the, the link uh, to the session uh, will be available on our YouTube channel. So we can post that in the, in the chat here and make it available as well. And I just want to remind everybody, if you're able to join us, um, uh, that uh, Dr. Elizabeth Cohen is going to talk about uh, her book, Illegal, uh, How America's Lawless Immigration Regime Threatens Us All. That's our uh, upcoming talk. It starts at about 5.30 um, as part of the program. I'm really looking forward to it, which also leads me to observe that today is the day of Cohen's. <laughs> we have a lot of <laughs> our, our presentations. Uh, so it, it's, it's really great. But again, Andrew, thank you so much for, for being here. Thanks to the audience, especially those who have stayed here through the very end, um, really appreciate it. And um, we wish you all the best and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you for having me. Thank you everybody for coming. And if you have questions about anything, feel free to send me an email or, or reach out in some way. Take care. Great. Thank you all. And thanks, Andrew.